Hello and welcome to our webinar on using primary sources in the social studies classroom. My name is Shane Gower and I teach at Marinica Community High School in Reedfield. I'm also the president of the Maine Council for the Social Studies and I wanted to just put a quick plug in for uh, our organization. We are the only professional organization for social studies educators in the state of Maine. And each year we hold an annual conference with K through 12 presentations on teaching social studies. Please visit our website, maincouncilsocialstudies.org for more information or to become a member. And if you're already a member, we thank you for your support. My presentation today is about using inquiry and primary sources together. The example I'll be talking about today, I used in my 11th grade US history classes. In my school, uh, as we have updated our curriculum over the last few years, we have incorporated the learning outcomes from the C3 frameworks for social studies. The C3 frameworks include an inquiry arc dimension. And so we've started the process of redesigning our curriculum nine through 12 with inquiry based units and lessons. One of the units that we use addresses the world wars, and that's where my example comes from today. Our unit that addresses the world wars has this compelling question. What happens when people fight over power? It also has four supporting questions. What were the results of the first world war? How does crisis create the need for new systems of government? How does one event change the course of history? And how can the desire to end conflict create increased tensions? This unit on the world wars includes three standards um, that we assess at the end of the unit um, and also along the way using formative assessments. Um, and then we have a summative assessment at the end of the unit. And as I said earlier, we are also using the C3 frameworks as outcomes to help us um, move students towards mastery of these standards. In order to get students engaged in the content and skills, I was looking for something in this particular unit that would spark curiosity among students in the same way that historians are sparked. So I turned to question formulation technique. And the book that you see here and the related website, writequestion.org, has really been a game changer for me in thinking about inquiry and the way that we approach the content and the primary sources within our units. If you're not familiar with QFT, the premise is this. When you use the question formulation technique, you are making one significant change in the traditional dynamic in the classroom, from using your question to prompt student thinking and work to challenging students to come up with their own questions. As I said, it's really a game changer. By using this technique, I've seen a huge increase in student engagement, critical thinking, and overall enthusiasm for learning. QFT is a great way to get students to think the way historians do. For this QFT, I give students a primary source document. In this case, it's a form from the US government asking the family of Millard Corson of Madison, Maine, what they would like to do with his remains. Millard Corson was killed in the First World War, and I was actually fortunate enough through a National History Day program to be able to research his life and travel to France um, in 2018 and visit his gravesite at the Wazon American Cemetery and deliver actually a eulogy at his grave. So when we are going to analyze a document, in this case, um, the, the Millard Corson document that I mentioned, um, one of the processes that I like to use um, is called getting happy with it. Okay, and in this case, the H stands for historical context, the A for audience, the intended audience, P for point of view, P for purpose, and Y for why should we care or the significance. So let's talk about each one of those when we get happy with a document. Uh, we start with historical context. And so this is what is happening in history around the same time as the date of the document that would help us to understand this document. Students should be able to draw in this context so prior learning must take place. In this particular case, I, asked, I, I had students watch a 12 minute video uh, about the first world war experience from a soldier's point of view. 
and a six minute video from the American Battle Monuments Commission about fallen soldiers and about the American cemeteries in Europe. And I actually included both links there if you're interested in, in checking those out. After historical context, students get the document. Students will read through the document, circling or recording any words they don't know, and then they will look them up. In this case, there's likely to not be many words that students don't know as 11th graders due to the nature of this document. However, again, you'd have to think about that in your own classroom, the level of the students, their prior experience, etc. Once they've read the document, they, they then must analyze the intended audience. The author who created this document, who were they creating it for, and how do you know? So students look at the sourcing information that may or may not include the author and draw inferences based on this information. Students reflect on the message and think about who would need to hear this message. In this case, this document is a form that was created by the US government to be filled out by someone. Um, we are looking at the audience intended by the person who filled out the form, not the intended audience for who created the form. So we spent a lot of time talking about the family of Millard Corson who filled in the form. Um, and specifically his mother, and uh, what kinds of things she might have been thinking about uh, in this process. It's that point of view. Students will now analyze the point of view or the perspective. Um, what is the author's bias or, or mindset? Students speculate and infer the mindset of the author and how this has affected the document and our understanding of what it means. In this particular case, students must think about what it might have been like for the fallen soldier's mother to have to make this decision and what may have been influencing her decision to either bring his remains home from Europe or leave his remains um, where they were buried. The next letter in, in happy is purpose. And so P for purpose. Why was this document created and what is its message? Students draw conclusions and make judgments about the document's message. In this case, students must recognize that it appears as though the author, uh, Miller's mother, made a decision and then changed her mind and tried to cross out the original decision. Students automatically begin to wonder why she might have changed her mind. Next up is the why for why should we care or the significance. Students draw conclusions and make judgments about the document's message. In this case, students must recognize that it appears as though, as I said before, the author has made a decision and then changed her mind. And the question is, why would she do that? And why does that matter? What does this tell us about the sacrifice of this soldier, as well as the sacrifice made by his family? And how does that get us to think about the legacy of the war that we feel today in our communities um, around the country? All right, now it's time for uh, primary source um, analysis, uh, reflection, and really thinking about um, getting happy with the document. So students then make notes um, for each of the letters. Uh, what's important for historical context? What do they know about the intended audience? What do they know about point of view, the purpose, and the significance? Once they've done that, now it's time for a QFT. And this is the document that students looked at, and I had to break it up into a few different slides. As I mentioned before, um, the document is a form from the US government um, addressed to the parent of Millard Corson. And as you can see, some things are crossed out on the document. It does appear as though his mother has changed her mind in this case. Now students are told to take two minutes and write down as many questions 
about this document as they can think of. This is the QFT process. Do not stop to judge, discuss, or answer any questions. Write down every question and change any statements into a question. These are just a few of the sample questions that my students have come up with um, after the last couple of years of doing this. And I just picked a few at random um, that I thought were particularly interesting to give you a variety of the types of questions that students came up with. And each one of them um, are interesting in their own right and bring to mind uh, more questions um, in most cases. The next step in the QFT process, once the students have written down all of those questions, is to look at their list of questions and look for questions that are closed-ended, label those with a C, and questions that are open-ended, label those with an O. And depending upon your level of students and your level of experience with QFT, um, you might need to talk about um, what is an open-ended question, what is a closed-ended question, the goal is to get as many uh, open-ended questions as possible. So now that you have your close-ended and open-ended questions, the next step in the process, I ask students to choose three questions from the list that you think are the most important. And think about why. Are they important because they're interesting, because they're difficult, because they can help you understand something else that's important? Is there some other reason? But prioritize those questions, one through three, the three most important and prioritize them one through three. I now ask students to share with a partner. I just think it's, a, it's great to share the different types of questions and it's a little less threatening to share them with one other person instead of the whole class. So I do ask students to share often when I do this um, with their partner. After they share with a partner, then they are going to choose one of the three to write down on a sticky note. Maybe the one they labeled as number one, but sometimes I will tell them, if you heard your partner had the same question, maybe you should pick number two, just to get a different question out there. So they're gonna write down one on the sticky note. Next, in this particular activity, I ask students to graph their question with the sticky note. On the whiteboard in my room, I then draw an axis like you see here, difficulty going up and interest going across. Students place their sticky note with the question on the graph where they think it falls. You can challenge students to now move up the graph and edit their questions for difficulty and interest. You can do this as a group or in small groups and ask questions uh, among the students, you know, how can we make this question more difficult? How can we make it more interesting? And really try to move those uh, sticky notes both up and to the right on that graph. I then ask students to take one of the sticky notes, not their own, someone else's, and once they have chosen one, they are now tasked with composing an answer to that question. This is how it might look, by the way, with the axis on the whiteboard. In this case, I asked students to create a slideshow with the question that they selected and their answer along with any sources used. There are different ways of doing this. It can be shared with just the original student who asked the question. It could be presented to the whole class. It could be simply submitted to the instructor. Again, there's a variety of ways of, of how you might use this. Now we debrief the questions that you see here. And this really gets students engaged in the compelling question and supporting questions for this unit through the use of a primary source. 
The questions they might generate are endless and the answers varied, but I have found that the enthusiasm and genu genuine interest uh, is really unmistakable and contagious. And so as you can see, um, these are great ways to connect back to our original inquiry-based unit that we started off with our compelling question related to the world wars, what happens when people fight over power? And as you can see, that question is here, along with some other questions as well that are related and connected. And so that is my presentation. Hi, I'm Jamie Carafa. I teach eighth grade social studies at Whittier Middle School in Poland, Maine. So my focus today is using document shuffles. Uh, first of all, I want to credit um, Massabesic High School for the term using or document shuffles. That's where I first heard it and first used it. Um, and this presentation came out of I'm part of a social studies book inquiry group. And a theme of our last discussion was that a lot of people feel like their kids aren't coming into their classroom with the skills needed to really investigate documents and, and really, you know, go as far as they could in social studies. And so I kind of wanted to gear this towards maybe the new teacher who's not used to using primary sources or um, Someone that doesn't necessarily know how to use them. Uh, well, or your kids don't know how to use them yet and how to kind of move through that. So that's my focus for today. So I pulled this quote from one of the books we're reading. I could not start my course with the first event to be covered in curriculum. Instead, I needed to teach my students how to think historically. So if you end up with kids that just don't really know how to do that yet, um, this is the process I use in my classroom. Um, so I use a document shuffle and what it is, is it's a collection of primary sources. Um, I usually post them around the room, sometimes at desks, sometimes on the walls and Students will get a handout to guide them. I'll show you what that looks like shortly. Um, students usually work in groups of two to three, and then they spend two minutes with each document. I actually have a timer that'll go off every two minutes. Uh, and then when we're finished, we all get back together and we go through each document as a class. So when to use them? First time um, might be to determine what your students know about thinking historically. Um, I, again, use this every, the beginning of every year um, to introduce a topic. Maybe your kids don't know about the topic or you don't know what they know about the next topic coming up. So we'll use this to explore documents using knowledge acquired on a topic. Sometimes we will um, use this to test what they already know by investigating the documents. And then also for the new teacher to practice using primary sources in your classroom. So these are the notes. Um, and what they do is they get a whole packet for each document and then each document is labeled. Um, and there's sometimes different questions, but the questions for this one is, what's going on in this picture? What do you see that makes you say that? And that's one, what's one question you'd ask the artist if he or she were here? So this is my introduction to document shuffles that I start my year with. I choose random documents from history I choose documents that are interesting or strange. Uh, I also like to choose documents that look like one thing but are something else or that look like multiple things. So these are four of the ones I've chosen. I randomly went online and said like primary source documents of different time periods or something and came up with them. So this would be an example is they would get this document and I would say, well, on the document shuffle, I'd say, what do you see? Some of the typical student responses to this picture are that it's a cart or carriage of some sort. Some kids will say that there's smoke coming off the top. That sometimes leads to a little bit of argument because some people say it's not smoke. Uh, they usually mention the blurry people in the background, uh, the buildings in the background, that it's a black and white photo, and then some will reference that there's a dirt street. Then the what's going on. So now that they know what they see in the picture, what is going on? And their, their typical response is some sort of carnival, uh, a parade, a gypsy cart, some famous person is traveling. Um, but I don't know if you know what this is, but this is actually President Lincoln's um, hearse carrying his body 
through town, I'm assuming. Um, and we get into the conversation of, okay, it's a black and white photo. So what time period it is that can help you with the things. Then I ask them, why are the, the people blurry? You know, and if you know about early photography that it doesn't always, um, if people are moving, they often become blurry. So this is probably early photography. So it can lead into a lot of different questions as well. So here's another one. What do you see? The first thing every class, every kid always says is the dead man. And I like to challenge them sometimes and say, well, how do you know he's dead? Because, you know, yes, he looks dead, but we don't really know he's dead. Uh, the woman, Cannon, the men in the background, the horses, the bucket. If a kid notices the bucket, please praise the student. Because as I explain this, what this picture is in the future, you'll see that actually has a huge relevance to it. So what do they see that's going on here? Um, based on what they saw, sometimes they say a woman is angry at the men and trying to stop them from shooting. Um, some say the men are angry at the woman and want her to get out of the way. Uh, one kid told me that a woman is cleaning the cannon. I thought that was interesting. It seems like a weird time to be cleaning a cannon. And then uh, some kids will notice and say, well, that's how you load a cannon. Um, and again, you have all these conversations and then I tell them, well, this is a picture of uh, Molly Pitcher, a woman who followed her husband on the battlefield, and um, I think the story goes that as he died, she jumped in his place and um, helped fight. Initially, she would just go around the battlefields carrying water for people, so I always assume that the buckets represent the water that she's carrying for the soldiers. Um, but again, this is one of those pictures that like, you don't really necessarily know what it is until you research it further but there's a lot of questions that kids can come up with. Uh, student assumptions. I like to really challenge them on this when they're historically thinking. Um, the picture on the left, they always tend to say that the uh, men to the right of the picture are all black. And I ask them why, and they say, well, they're darker, you know, skin. And, um, you know, I, I let them know when we're discussing it, these are actually Chinese workers working in the gold mine. Um, or mining gold. And, and so it's, it's good to kind of call them out on their assumptions, but to let them see those things and then tell them what they really are. Um, and then the one on the right, they assume that this is a baseball team from the state of Maine, and these are actually um, sailors from the USS Maine. I'm assuming that that was their baseball team at the time. Uh, sometimes they can pull out that the guy in the middle is wearing a, a sailor uniform and, and maybe kind of piece that together, but they always assume that these are all men from Maine. And so it's kind of fun to, to challenge that too. So questions to further discussion. Um, the neat thing I find about the document shuffles is you don't really have to push them to participate, especially when you ask, what do you see? The kids that never participate in class will jump in because you can't get it wrong. What do you see? I see a person, you know, I, I see, this, I see that. So you get a lot of kids participating in it, but sometimes I like to take conversation further with the documents. So like what time period and how do you know? Um, on the right, kids will point out, some kids will point out that it's a colored photo. So that helps us know that it's, you know, after the technology change where they could make colored photos. Um, some kids will, will try to figure out the period by the weapons they're holding or the uniforms they're holding. Usually somebody in class will get it, but um, not always. The one thing that they do get, that this isn't the Revolutionary War, obviously, this isn't the Civil War, um, thankfully, that that comes out. And then, what are the facial expressions telling us in this picture? I always ask this question because kids often ignore that until you ask them, you know, and, and what is her, her face saying here? Now, obviously, this is a very famous picture. Most of my eighth grade students, well, I shouldn't say most, maybe some of them have seen this but they don't all know what it's from. Um, so I love to challenge them and say, so what is, what is her face showing me? You know, and the kids always tell me that these kids in the background are crying. And I say, well, how do you know? I, I can't see their faces. How do you know? Do you see tears somewhere? Um, but what we can see is her face. And then I ask them, you know, what, what emotions do you see there? Sadness, fear, scared. Um, unsure, you get all these different things. And, and then when you piece together what this is about, they're able to kind of interpret it a little bit better. I also like to choose text that's sometimes really difficult for them, but 
things that we can piece together. So here is um, a document I like to use. And the first thing I say to them is what words stand out to you? Because most kids in eighth grade, and I should say probably most kids in all schools, don't like to read things that are complicated. They don't like to try to investigate them or figure them out. They just wanna look at it and know the answer. So they kind of give up on this document. So before we can figure out what it is or what that, I say, what words stand out to you? And, and kids raise their hands. They say, God and country and king and honor and Virginia. So these are the things that are, you know, standing out to them. I'm sorry for the noise in the background. My dog is moving around the floor. Um, but these are words that point out to them. I say, okay, so what does that tell us about the time period? God, king, country, Virginia, first colony. What, what, what does that tell us? And often you get kids that say, oh, well, the kings used to send people to, the, you know, to America. Or obviously these people are religious. Um, okay, they're creating a new place in Virginia. Um, you know, and you get to have further conversations where we kind of piece it together. And then I ask them, you know, so what's the time period? And they're usually ab able to pull out that this is like the beginning of America. Once we kind of have that conversation of what words stand out to you, what do these words make you think? Um, so it's kind of fun to have them investigate text and then to start challenging them to really pull out what they do know. Because, and I say to them, most of you don't necessarily know what solemnly means or covenant or advancement or undertaken, but you can piece together based on some of the words in there and investigate them. Um, another thing that my coworker and I like to do is we also like to start um, units using documents. So if you don't have time for a full document shuffle or you don't have a time to fully discuss, you know, 10 documents. We'll do this to kind of introduce a topic and get them thinking about it. Um, it's usually more interesting for them and um, it allows them to think historically. So this is an example of a sit and begin that we would do. So this would be when they come right into class, they would get this picture and they would have the questions. Um, and this is for the beginning of Pearl Harbor. So they wouldn't know it's going to be about Pearl Harbor, but they would be asked, what are five ob observations you have of this photograph? They'd have to write down five things they see. Um, and then what is this? And so after they write down the five things, what is this? And no, I haven't done this in my class, but um, my coworker did it last year and, and she just said it was, it was really interesting to hear their interpretations of the ship underground, it's an American flag. Um, they really have no idea what this is and they really have no idea what it has to do with. And then once we get into Pearl Harbor and kind of piecing together the information, then it kind of becomes a little bit more clear for them. And then another example that we start a unit with is for our Japanese internment um, unit, we will do this as a sit and begin. I love this picture. It is so fascinating to hear kids talk about this picture. Um, so in what country was this photograph taken? Well, some people will say America, because it says I am an American. Um, one thing that I'm always amazed that kids point out is there's a tiny little flag in the back left corner, hang on top of the, the building in the background. They always notice that and they always know it's an American flag. Um, but then some kids will point out the writing on the corner of the building and they'll say, oh, it's Japanese, it's Chinese. And I'm like, well, do you really know what it is? No, but we know it's not English. Um, so we kind of make guesses about that. And then around what year and what's your evidence? They'll say around the 1920s, 1940s. That's usually the time frame they get. And their evidence they use is the car. I've heard them use the mailbox um, as an example. So then the question of what kind of business is pictured in this photograph? Uh, obviously it's a grocery store. They know that. Who owns it? Well, they'll guess it's an American. They'll guess it's White and Pollard, um, Wonko company in the front. Those are kind of their guesses. And then why do you think the business is being sold? This usually stumps them. They're, they're not really sure. They don't really have an answer. Um, and then why would someone create a sign that says I am an American and post it outside of a business? You get a lot of different reasons. Um, maybe they want people to know 
maybe they're in a community where they're the only Americans. A lot of different answers are given, but in the end, we kind of piece it all together and um, I share with them, you know, this is a Japanese family that owns a grocery store and they're told they have only so much time to sell their business and to get out. So that's what they're doing here. Um, and they're putting that sign up to, to let their neighbors know that they are an American and that they do deserve to stay here. Um, so again, a lot of great questions, a, a lot of, um, a lot of great answers to the questions and all based on, um, just observing a picture and telling what they see.